and to help me in this exciting discussion, allow me to start to introduce my panelists, uh, which is of course a very interesting combination of people that are coming from different financial sector background who I think are well vested basically to cover uh, this topic. My name is Mukwandi Chwesakunda, I'm Chief Executive at uh, Zanako, which is um, the largest bank in terms of distribution. We have been in existence for 52 years serving the Zambian people, and we believe that with a wealth of experience over the 52 years, growing to about 2.5 million customers, we are well placed to identify how can we serve you better. And that is why I'm here today to identify solutions jointly and also to share what we are doing in Zanaco. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move on to the next. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Evelyn Kaingo and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lupia. Uh, we are basically a fintech that provides online loans to individuals and businesses. And as I said on this panel, I'm here to challenge the banks that 65% of uh, individuals in Zambia are still uh, financially excluded and 70% of that is the women. And so with our platform, we've embarked on providing uh, financial solutions for this demographic, as we still feel that banks are not attending to the financial needs of emerging markets. Thank you, Evelyn. I'll move on to Madam Kara. Thank you. My name is Yaza Kara. I'm representing Stanbic Bank. My role at the bank is um, I look after innovation as well as partnerships. Stanbic Bank, uh, our, our mission is Zambia is the home. We drive her growth. In that aspect, we are passionate about how we build Zambia's economy through financial inclusion and ensuring that we provide financial services that are valuable to our citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, last but not the least on my panel, let's see Dr. Mungule. Uh, good morning, uh, fellow participants. Um, I'm from the Bank of Zambia. Um, in the uh, research and regulatory policy of the Bank's provision department, um, I'm privileged to to, to be a panelist in the midst of the banks and uh, the, the fintech, uh, so that uh, probably can provide some uh, some regulatory uh, cover. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And of course, to moderate uh, this session, my name is Monga Hamugale. I'm basically senior manager within the PwC advisory practice focusing mainly on corporate finance and joint. So the question in particular, which I have, um, Mukwandi, especially in particular to yourselves and Zanako, is um, where do you see the opportunities to save this market segment in a way that creates, of course, a win-win uh, situation, uh, that is micro entrepreneurs and SMEs having access to the financial services that grow and expand businesses while banks at the same time continue, of course, to maximize uh, on their profit return. Thank you for the question. As I said earlier, uh, we believe as commercial banks that we have a role to play in our communities. And oftentimes, even when we do play that role, um, it's not recognized as such. So, for example, as Zanako, uh, we believe that SMEs are the engine for growth and the growth of any economy, including Zambia. When you look at the type of SMEs that we have in the Zambian market, most of them are in the agriculture business. And we have solutions such as AgriPay, which is actually intended to make sure that the farmer is able to provide their inputs. We participate in that for the 1 million farmers in this market. We also then feed in through whatever sales they have to make sure that their product gets to market. And within that process, we're also eliminating the middleman because a lot of the time the farmers don't get the right pricing. So our view is that beyond just lending, 
we're also creating that whole ecosystem that enables the SME to grow. Where it comes to the female sector, as women, interesting panel that we have here, um, which implies where the market is going. And um, we believe that we have solutions for women. We have, actually, we just call it women's banking. And within that product, we're able to then deliver services. We recognize that actually, um, over the years, it has been shown that women are actually better payers of loans than men are. And so we have been able to pull together products that serve this particular population. And beyond that, to recognize the segment for who we are as women. Finally, in terms of digital services, that is the lowest cost way to serve uh, the wider segment that has often been unbanked. And we recognize that as banks, we have not necessarily served this segment as well as we could. But if you look at the last two years, there has been a shift. A lot of the time you'll find that we have uh, multinational operations, we have uh, MNOs uh, who deliver mobile banking solutions. At the back of those MNOs are actually commercial banks, but we jointly deliver these solutions to the market, the lower end of the market, so that they're able to get that low amount of money in terms of the, um, the loans that they require on a day-to-day -day basis. But at the end of the day, they're able to then keep their businesses going and keep growing. So what we do is we partner with the MNOs, we partner with um, the cooperatives on the ground for the farming uh, community. We partner with the women in our society to make sure that we're delivering the right solutions to grow and be relevant going into the future. Finally, talking about sustainable uh, solutions, we as Zanaco have put together a product that we believe is going to be a game changer because having seen that Zambia has the highest uh, level of deforestation on the continent, Africa, and fifth in the world, we came together with WWF and Kupila Capital to put together solutions that will then cater for that. We went on the ground, actually, um, Sarah Bloom is here, I must mention that she facilitated that for us. We went on the ground jointly with WWF and the British High Commission and identified issues jointly with the Minister of Green Economy, identified what the issues are on the ground. Those are our customers. We found that some of those um, farmers on the ground are actually banking with us. So a lot of the time we misunderstand the nature of our clients to just be a particular segment, but we cut across the various pieces. And what we need to start doing is to reimagine how can we serve these clients better. And the only way to really serve them better is to talk to them, go on the ground. Unfortunately, COVID is creating a bit of a challenge currently, but we believe that by engaging our customers, by engaging the community, by working together, we'll deliver those digital solutions, those sustainable agri solutions, so that people are not actually deforesting Zambia, they're actually doing other things, beekeeping, that will then give them that capacity to grow, but at the same time, keep the environment safe. Thank, thank you. you. No, no thank, thank you, Mpandi, for that elaborative response. But before I ask you any further follow-on questions, because of, I, I, I think to, for it to be a bit more engaging, there is some particular questions I want to, you to respond to. But allow me first of all to go to extend the same question to uh, Yaza, because she plays in a similar space. I think it would be interesting to understand what Stanbeck is doing, uh, especially in particular to uh, get a win-win situation to sort of like extend some of these solutions to their unbanked sector. Thank you for that question. At Stanbeck Bank, we realize that banking has evolved significantly. It has changed significantly, but we do also understand that banking in its very essence has remained the same. Why I say this, people still need lending facilities, people still need savings facilities, they still need to make deposits, we still need to transact as an economy. While we understand and, and we do believe that banks are trusted, we are huge entities and what comes with that is, is the trust. We have been in, in existence for years, decades, 
And that's what keeps us uh, grounded, that trust that we have in our customers. However, we lack the agility to change. We have consumers now who are used to agility. They want new products, uh, new solutions as quickly as possible. We, we struggle with that. We're getting there, but we, we, we do struggle at the moment as banks because of how big we are, how we're regulated and so on. At Stanley Bank, what we've done, we've totally changed our structure in terms of how we're structured as, as, as a bank. We have gone into restructuring like you, like you can't imagine. For instance, a role like mine, innovation and partnerships, it did not exist in banking, but it's there now. We've gone into um, restructuring and having a, a whole segment called client solutions, where we're creating solutions that are specific to what the customer wants. We have customers who are on another level, what we're calling digital natives, digital immigrants, people who want instantaneous um, banking services. So when it comes to SMEs and, and how can we serve these SMEs better and, and the micro um, in, entrepreneurs of course we we still as i said the basics of banking how can we help them save how can we help them um get products that that allow them to to borrow to provide them with capital on top of the restructuring what we've done we've also created new um new functionality and capability within the bank. So we have a full-fledged enterprise data office. What this data office does is look into the data, understand how our customers are, are, are transacting. With this data, they're able to understand um, the transactability history of, of, of our customers and be able to then come up with, uh, with the credit worthiness of these particular we, go, we use uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data analytics to get to, 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 to some of these um, conclusions. And um, maybe a little bit later, I can, I can also discuss one of our, our trader direct solutions, which is actually built on AI and data analytics. So we're, we're, we've become very deliberate in how we, we, we give our financial services to our, to our consumers. We want to become more than a bank. We want to go beyond banking. So yes, we're gonna be doing the lending, the transactions. We want to do more than that. We want to, work to, to be able to play in different ecosystems so that we can bring in different producers, different consumers and become the orchestrator of these uh, different entities. We want to start um, breaking down different products into modular into modular pieces because consumers don't always want the whole suite of whatever it is you're, you're offering. They want smaller components. We're going to break these into modular and easier um, components that the, that the consumer can then use. And we, in essence, what we're trying to build and what we are building, and, uh, and I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but we, we're building a platform business something that will orchestrate and bring all the players together. So um, we're going beyond banking. We're becoming much, much more than a bank. Thank you. Sure. No, it's interesting that you both Mukwandi and, uh, and Yaza seem to touch on some very interesting products in terms of innovations, basically to try and extend easy access to the, uh, to the banking solutions. I think the um, insight that would be interested probably to hear is what role do the non-bank financial institutions also sort of play and Evelyn I'm going to invite you basically probably to give a comment then later on I think we'll sort of like focus around what does the regulation sort of like dictates and I'll probably ask uh, Dr. Mungule to respond to that. Uh, thanks for that uh, question Monga. Um, so typically as a fintech, uh, we sort of have to uh, restructure ourselves to look at alternative financing. Uh, Lupia is born out of uh, a platform uh, out of individuals who couldn't meet uh, typical banking requirements and uh, couldn't access formal financial services. And so uh, we pretty much uh, set out into providing a platform with just uh, as little as 6,800 6, parcher to be precise and lending very small uh, ticket sizes to community groups. And it's from there that we pivoted as well into uh, providing uh, 
uh, uh, uh, loans to individuals uh, and these are individuals and businesses who typically cannot uh, access more financial services and so uh, what we've just um, uh, built upon is just uh, being a tech enabled business is to sort of look at the data points that are available which is very hard to find as uh, as a fintech institution and to start, to start building uh, products uh, and services that really address a very big underserved market and this is something that we have done as, as an institution sure. and um, so I mean we are very happy with the sort of traction and progress that we have made uh, uh, it's not a very uh, easy uh, journey to embark on uh, setting uh, products where market segments can provide the information and being a tech enabled business this is what we need to think about all the time and how we really deliver our products to last mile so even though we do leverage a lot of the banking platforms, uh, we do leverage our uh, MNOs into how we actually reach our customers and deliver our products. But we also then still remain uh, cognizant of the fact that um, uh, we still need to deliver a product to, to gaps that are not being uh, technically uh, filled. And this is where we have come in as an institution and uh, looking at our journey, uh, it's been one way we've grown for the last five years with very uh, uh, small resources and bootstrapped our way into where we are now. Uh, where we just recently got our PC investment uh, from Enigma Ventures and then just recently from Google. And uh, this is something where we've just uh, really focused on SME financing and ensuring uh, at looking at what alternative data points can we really use out there to attend to market segments that cannot uh, actually uh, meet requirements. So um, the big question for us lies in, can we provide SME financing without financial statements? which we are uh, looking at seeing whether those possibilities can happen. Can we uh, look at uh, providing uh, financial uh, solutions without even looking at um, uh, bank statements, for example? And so this is some of the things that we're looking at because the markets that we are looking to save do not have this type of information. And that's sort of what we have embarked on as a platform and ensuring that we can provide financing. Sure. Now to just extend a similar question now, but mainly looking more from a regulatory perspective, uh, out as Dr. Mugule in terms of uh, how can regulation essentially, especially in Zambia, uh, promote innovations? You've heard what, uh, for instance, Zanak or Stanbik are trying to do. Uh, they did make mention that they are quite open to partnerships, but of course those partnerships are underpinned in terms of what is it that the Bank of Zambia also has to bring onto, onto the market, especially from a regulatory point of view. So the question really is, um, what is it that as a central bank that you're actually doing to make sure that the financial inclusion sector while protecting the consumers and ensuring that there is responsibility done but at the end of the day you also want to make sure that uh, there is a sort of like mutual uh, engagements between the financial uh, solution providers vis-a-vis -vis the consumer thank you so much um the the role of the central bank is uh, basically to uh, to make sure that um, uh, the market, the financial market, is um, is is stable, and uh, that uh, consumers are protected. Consumers of the financial products, uh, being it uh, banking products or payments products. Uh, so you can see that um, with the coming on board of the uh, uh, ministry sponsor for green economy, uh, there is a lot of appetite. The appetite for, from the financial institutions has gone up in terms of trying to, you know, to get into the market and uh, get a share uh, of a share of profits from there. So now, what what uh, what we are talking about uh, is something surrounding the, uh, the electronic payments upgrades systems. So you, you, you currently we, we have the national financial switch and uh, all these players are connected and they have individual uh, you know, systems uh, to, serve their, to serve their clients. So now the the issue is at what cost are these financial institutions going to provide these uh, uh, innovations so that they reach, uh, you know, rural areas um, where we have a lot of uh, people who are underserved. Um, so we're looking at uh, 
uh, discussions around um, look, improving on the infrastructure, financial market infrastructure, uh, to, up, to upgrade it to uh, ISO 222, and, um, and also by providing a shared agent banking platform, uh, SFBAP, uh, which will provide a switch for interoperability of agent transactions. So we've seen that uh, to get into, into, into that uh, space uh, requires that. Also, uh, what we have at the moment is that uh, uh, there is some little bit of a gap in terms of uh, the provision of an electronic wallet, uh, uh, which is an uh, electronic wallet platform, um, uh, which needs to be linked into the national switch. And um, so once that is done, then um, um, the bank will then, you know, help government in trying to uh, bring on board all those um, uh, individuals who may not have a formal bank account, but they can access uh, financial services uh, through what we are calling some uh, agent banking. Uh, and that is under our, uh, you know, strategy of uh, uh, greening the financial financial sector. Secondly, um, banks are using uh, uh, artificial intelligence systems, and um, and in, in terms of their operations, collection of data, and, and so on and so forth. So we are we are, we have discussions surrounding the. Uh, supervisory technology, uh, soup tech. Uh, so we have to move from the current uh, uh, paperwork into soup tech, which is a data management and, uh, and use uh, uh, platform for us to make timely decisions as, as a center. Um, so this will be meant to develop um, and uh, you know, in integrate artificial intelligence in regulatory and supervisory structures. Uh, and therefore that will make the bank more, uh, more uh, responsive, okay? Uh, because as a central bank, our, our precondition is to minimize the risks, the risks that uh, that arise as a result of the regulated entities' operations, so that we maintain a stable financial system and uh, we, ment we, we maintain lower cost. So, uh, in terms of the other aspects that uh, we're looking at, um, uh, Dr. We Dr. Have... maybe before you go to that, eh? what I wanted to also find out from you is. Uh... Uh, those interventions you are trying to do at the central bank, to what extent basically do you involve the players in the sector, like for instance, the likes of Zanaco, Lupia and, uh, and Stanvik? Because as you would appreciate, I think they are the enablers uh, within the ecosystem. So just wanted to understand, um, as you are formulating some yeah. of those regulatory strategies, to what extent basically do you work with these players? Um... Thank you. The Bank of Zambia has, uh, um, you know, relationships with the Bankers Association of Zambia, and um, and and also we, whenever we are trying to uh, implement a regulation, we do uh, conduct what is known as a regulatory impact assessment. So, a regulatory impact assessment. What it means is that uh, before we implement we we'll call a stakeholder engagement. And, um, and uh, at that stakeholder engagement, that's when we shall agree in terms of how uh, the central bank can, can proceed with the regulations. So for instance, if you're talking about um, uh, electronic uh, clearing systems, um, we have a vehicle that is tasked with, with, with that purpose, which is Zekio. And under Zekio, 
the banks as well as the, the central bank are the shareholders. So Zeku as a board, and those decisions are discussed at the board level at Zeku, where the banks are involved. So there's a lot of involvement of all the stakeholders in terms of everything that the central bank does. Uh, if you're looking at the agent banking, yeah. agent banking has already passed the regulatory assessment and um, it's just uh, waiting for, for, for the central bank to, to issue some directives so that, uh, so that uh, the, the players can now be guided in terms of how exactly do they proceed with the business of agent banking. So we, we do, we do in, 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 in involve a lot of sure. stakeholders. No, no, thank you so much. Um, Mkwandi, coming back to you, earlier on you did touch on a very interesting statistic, especially from a Zanapo perspective, that you had almost 2.5 million. I think that's quite a very good number. But from the conversations that Evelyn has submitted, the market is still out there. You also did allude to the fact that um, you are open to partnerships. You're already working some MNOs, uh, some fintechs in terms of enabling some of the solutions that you are providing. Probably I just want you to take a step back and ask you specific questions around what is it that the, the fintechs ought to know if they were to go into strategic partnerships with, uh, with Zanak. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think we're very ready to partner. And uh, over the years we have implemented various partnerships and what we have learned through our partnerships with the fintechs is that because of the nature of the fintechs and how they operate they're in a hurry to implement certain things the nature of banking is that we receive money from the public and we have a custodial responsibility to look after those funds and so the regulations, I think just listening to the regulator speak, you can tell that there is a lot that is required for us to be able to go out to market with new products, new services. We're very open as bankers to all these new solutions. However, sometimes the regulations do curtail our ability to move very quickly. For example, as banks, the requirements for our KYC, uh, know your customer, are different from those that they allow for mobile banking. There, it's just your NRC and um, you can get your, your number and your address. But for banking, there is a lot more that is required. And especially for a company, there is even more. And this then creates blockage in terms of how we can partner with the fintechs. But what we have realized is that over the years, there has been a level of understanding as commercial banks, we have moved, the regulator has moved, the fintechs have moved. And what we can see is a meeting of minds yeah. now. On the basis of that meeting of minds, we have various partnerships as Zanaco. And by the way, as Zanaco, we own a fintech called DSSL Digital Paygo. It's been in existence for three years and we have learned a lot by owning an actual fintech, 100% owned by Zanaco, but we do not run the operation. So we can see them running and we can see the differences between a commercial bank and the way that a fintech operates. But we're not limited to that fintech in terms of partnerships. And the fintech is not limited to Zanaco in terms of commercial bank partnerships because the future is shared. Everything is shared. Now you go, you're looking for a hotel, you go booking.com or you go, what's the other one? Um, Airbnb. All that is shared. Even you can carpool. There's so many things in the new economy that is about sharing. So even within the economic perspective, part of these partnerships is about sharing as long as there is that meeting of minds in terms of the capacity. Zanaco has also been very strong in the agency side. We have 15,000 agents currently countrywide and it's their highest in the market. And we believe that these agents for the time being, I just deal with Zanako. But in future, why should we limit ourselves? <coughs> At the end of the day, we're here reimagining the future because we do believe that with the level of disruption that the world has gone through with COVID and um, all the various issues, the climate change that is coming at us, we need to rethink how we operate. We need to reimagine how we'll be seen in future. How do we make this exciting? But at the same time, bear in mind that we're regulated entities and we are looking after the people's money. 
So as we look at our triple bottom line and we're saying we're building sustainable businesses, we partner with the fintechs, we partner with whoever else we need to partner with to create that ecosystem. At the end of the day, that triple bottom line is about being aware that socially we're also making impact as well as making the money commercially and also dealing some of the environmental issues. So I think we're in a good place with regards to that. Interesting. Before I move away from you, yeah. so you did make mention that you have to imagine the future, I think, which is uh, something that is excellent. The fact that you're already thinking around that tra trajectory. The um, question that I have for you, I think you have seen in the press recently, I think in the last few weeks or so, um, that especially in certain uh, African markets, in particular Nigeria, I think the MNOs has since been granted banking licenses. Yes. So essentially, I would believe and imagine that they are basically bringing a new dimension altogether, especially to the banking uh, industry, because now you've got this new player that's riding already on very well developed uh, technology. I think the question I have is uh, what is currently uh, banks, what are they thinking around some of those shifts in terms of where banking basically is headed to? At the end of the day, whenever there are changes or disruptive issues that come up, what needs to happen is, first of all, you understand your own strengths, what you're bringing to the table, and you also understand what is coming. And as I earlier alluded to, we have a meeting of minds. So if an MNO is coming into the commercial banking space, why can't the commercial bank go into the MNO space? Why are we limited to only being what we have always been traditionally? We're not. And if you look at what's happened in, in Africa, commercial banks have gone into MNO space and they're delivering very well. So you can have on your SIM, you can have a SIM overlay on your phone. So it, uh, it's agnostic as to which uh, MNO is behind whatever the phone is. Financial services are based on that SIM overlay. All you need is to buy that SIM overlay and put it there in the phone sure. as a bank. So we're now looking at, okay, what should we be doing in this space to make sure that we're also growing? Because at the end of the day, a business is business. There's an opportunity. We can't stop people from coming into our space, but what we can do is defend and grow and identify what is our strength, what are we bringing to the table, and how do we make sure that we, we are creative and innovative to deliver at the end of the day to the customer. Sure. So I think SIM overlay is a possible solution for that. Interesting to see you that you're actually evolving. Uh, Evelyn, I think you've heard what uh, Mokwandi has just submitted in terms of the way they are trying to reposition themselves. Um, hearing from what um, Yaza had, had mentioned earlier on in terms of their openness to partnerships. I know you probably are targeting different markets, different niche. Uh, so the question probably I have for you is, uh, do you see any potential partnerships with commercial banks, of course, uh, in extension to the MNOs and other fintechs as would be? Um, I mean, uh as much as uh, fintechs like to challenge the banks, uh, we need them. We need those partnerships in place, and that's pretty much how we deliver our products. Uh, right now, our displacements happen through banking channels, through m and uh, uh, partnerships. And so, um, as even as we are positioning ourselves to even reach the last mile, which is pretty much the next tenant that we're looking at, we are starting to look at data points that are coming from banks and other m and in terms of can we position ourselves into providing uh, pharma inputs, uh, pay-as-you-go models, the agent models that exist today, uh, as well as just looking at cross-border uh, trading and those data points. And as we're also just positioning as a tech business and moving away from being tech-enabled, we will need to deliver our products uh, to sit on other partnerships like MNOs uh, to pretty much uh, reach our last mile of our customers. And this is what we are doing now. And so even though we, we, we question what the banks are doing and uh, we, we feel like we are addressing uh, this huge market uh, in the best way uh, channels we can. We still need to leverage uh, those partnerships because they, uh, they do a lot for us. I mean, our sales pipelines come through those uh, partnerships. Our fundraising comes through these partnerships. Um, the, a lot of data that we use comes through these partnerships. And so uh, even for us to even uh, put out a valuable product that's going to really address these markets, uh, it's going to come from banking partnerships as well as MNOs or other organizations out there that are supporting us 
uh, supporting our agenda to uh, push financing into SMEs. And this is where we've uh, positioned ourselves as a fintech as well. We can't do without them. And we really are engaging them to ensure that uh, we reach our customer bases with these partnerships. Sure. Um, Yeza, coming to you, 2019 was an interesting year for Stanbeck. Um, you did publish uh, an annual report, which basically you launched a trader's talk uh, advance in partnership with the uh, financial technology company. Probably just for the benefit of the audience, are you able to just uh, tell us briefly in terms of uh, what this partnership was all about, uh, what kind of traders were you targeting, and how basically can they get access to it? Okay, absolutely. And, and this is um, one solution that we're extremely proud of um, at Stanbeck Bank. It's a remarkable trader solution. Uh, I don't like using the word product. I find it a bit, so I'll, I'll term it as a solution. What it entails is um, providing loan facilities to traders. And when I say traders, it's your typical merchant, your typical uh, guy or lady on, on who's got a uh, not really in, uh, in Temba, because in Temba is maybe movable. Well, so even a stand in the bank, in the market, sorry, because a stand has a number and it's not easily movable. But we also look at the brick and mortar shops. So this trader in this shop is who we provide this facility to. We provide them with a, with a gadget, a device. And what this device does, um, and we give them a an amount, say maybe a 300 kwacha, very micro loan, to give them for one month. And they use the device to transact, whether they're selling talk time, buying and selling talk time, whether they're buying and selling fast moving goods from an entity like Trade Kings or British American Tobacco. We were able to then assess the transactability of this merchant or trader in that one month. So it takes a month, not the three months that banks normally ask in terms of statements and so on, one month. And we're able to ascertain the credit worthiness of this particular trader. Once that's done, after that month is over, we then give that trader the loan amount that they're eligible to get. Most of the time it's between 300 kwacha and 3000 kwacha. And this trader continues to use this device that, that we've provided. All the while, the data is 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 is, is being is, is being captured. We're able to understand the pattern. We're able to understand how this trader is 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 working in terms of credit worthiness. At the end of it all, when they've sold their 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 stock, it's depleted. They then can then get a new a, a new loan, and the new stock advance comes through. What we've also done, um, we've also, we also have uh, a, a quite ex advanced uh, robotics um, department in the bank. So we've built robots and we have a robot on this particular trader's solution that goes as far as creating limits. It goes as far as updating the, the credit when the credit is, is depleted. And what this does is that it aids in the custom, in the customer experience for the trader. Imagine the trader's uh, advance is over, it's, it's, it's depleted and he has to start filling in a form or calling the bank. No, he doesn't have to do that. The bot takes care of that. So it, 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 it upgrades, um, updates the, the credit and uh, if there's a limit that's required, it does all of that. So it's such a remarkable solution. Uh, we have over 5,000 traders already on it and it's so it's so progressive in the sense that in one month, a trader can, be, can get an advance of 500. In the next month, that because of doing so well, it easily goes up to even 1,000 and so on. So we've seen um, our traders are extremely happy and we're looking forward to, to it scaling even more. So it's, it's remarkable. How, and maybe if I can just do a bit of advertising, if, if if, the tra if there are any traders out there who would like to jump onto this solution with Stan Big Bank, please just reach out to our 8200 number or visit a branch and we'll, we can easily come and just assess and see 
how we can onboard you to start using this, this facility. Thanks. Sure. Um, unfortunately, time is not on our side. Um, I know probably the audience is itching to ask the panelists uh, some questions in certain areas where you might need some clarity. So I know the I've been signaled in terms of how much time I have. So I think at this stage, I'm going to pause and uh, invite, if at all we've got any questions in the audience that you'd want basically the panelists to, to respond. Thank Please. you so much. My name's are Philip Ngongo. I'm from uh, Global Commodities Advisory. So um, my question borders around uh, uh, lending itself. Because I think one of the challenges that we have in the Zambian market is uh, it's not all that easy for, I would say, the underserved. If I can pick one category, I would say smallholder farmers to access finance. And uh, if you look around in the market, that, what has been happening in the past is uh, the return on investment on things like uh, treasury bills have been very high, as high as, say, 27% before the new government came in, but now they've dropped to somewhere around 12%. But uh, we all know that uh, financial institutions like banks, they price their loans uh, in line with uh, what they're getting from, from, from the government. And uh, the conversation that we are having around impact investment, obviously, like to me, I think I look at it as a diversification on the side of the bank, but, uh, how does a bank get to diversify to start giving money to people underserved, people like uh, smallholder farmers when the return on investment they are getting is, is very high. So this is a challenge that we have. And uh, I think a lot of people are not talking about this issue. So, and I'm happy that we, we do have Bank of Zambia on, on the panel. And uh, for, for us, we feel as long as the return on investment on things like uh, treasury bills and bonds are high, it will be very difficult for institutions like bank to diversify, to start giving money to the underserved. So I think we just have to be clear on, on, on what we are looking for. And maybe I would like to get a response from the panel, especially Stanbic and uh, and uh, Zanako, how I just want to get an understanding on how they define risk, because most of us, when we talk about risk, we're only looking at the bad outcome. So, and risk has, there are so many things that you can say about risk, because if there's an opportunity for you to make money in the category which is underserved, like smallholder farmers, and there's an opportunity for you to make money and you haven't taken uh, that opportunity to put in your money, you've lost money, that's a risk on your side. But there's also the risk of you losing your money when you lend to that category. So I just want to understand how you define risk as uh, financial institutions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think just allow me to sort of like summarize. I just want to be specific so that we save on time. Two questions I'm picking from him. One is it pricing on your credit lines. Should we expect to see a downward trend in terms of pricing on especially Stanbic and Zanako's uh, pricing of your loans? And secondly, is what is your assessment around risk? I'll probably start with you, Kwande. Thank you for the question. Um, I was actually waiting to see if someone would ask it because that seems to be the, the general view that uh, it's not easy to, to access funding. I think there are various um, solutions in the market that people are just not aware of. So similar to the earlier conversation regarding NAPSA and the amount of funding that is available uh, for them to go into private equity, there is a lot of funding that is available for the SMEs. Some of the funding is actually through grants and it's not just the, the banks. The banks also partner uh, with partners such as Prospero and other such who can then work with us for the grant side and also work with um, the, the various entities and SMEs to grow you from a technical perspective. Because what we've also identified is that sometimes it's not money that an SME needs, it's capacity and understanding of their market and being able to technically be able to deliver to that. 
beyond just the money expectation. So we try to train people to understand what they may require their business. And in that training, we then identify who we can lend to. And on the basis of that, be able to lend to them and grow them. So there are various options that we have. And I believe that uh, following this session, you can talk to us about whatever it is that you are looking for. But the nature of uh, banking is that sometimes you'll be able to get the money, sometimes you may not. So in anything in life, sometimes the answer can be yes, sometimes the answer can be no. What you need to understand is when it's no, why? And what can I do about it? And I think that's the gap that we don't necessarily address, particularly as commercial banks, because when, we, when it's a no, we just say it's a no, and we don't explain to the customer exactly why it is that that is the outcome. And what we're now doing is engaging the clients to an extent that they fully understand what they need to do about their business to grow it, to get it to a level where they're able to access that funding. And based on that, we're seeing a lot more uh, positive responses. In terms of the pricing itself, that's market driven. If you look at where inflation is, if you look at where, as you said, the uh, government uh, treasury bill rates are, when you put all that together, that is how we price into the market in terms of lending. However, as I said earlier, there are other options depending on the affordability to be able to then access other forms of funding such as grants and other initiatives. Where it comes to how we, we view risk, we're in the business of risk. Even just carrying a hundred kwacha, do you know that that's a risk? Because it can, you can lose it. Now we're dealing with hundreds of millions of kwacha every day when in the business of risk. As I said earlier, we take the money from the public based on the fact that the public knows that when they want to get their money back on demand, we will pay them that money. So even as we lend, we need to be very clear that whoever we're lending to will be able to pay us back so that we can in turn pay back whoever has lent to us. So that is how we view risk. We look at the person who is coming to us to borrow from us and we're saying, if we lend to this person, what's the likelihood that they will pay? Because it's not our money. It's the money that belongs to the person who deposited with us. And based on that, we have a responsibility to get that money back. And so that is how we view risk and we price in for the risk and we try to de-risk by engaging the customers, the clients, and saying, this is how you can improve your business. But we do lend a lot. Understand that even as we go and put money into treasury bills and government bonds, a significant portion of our book is actually to the public. As Zanapa alone, we have 10 billion kwacha out. So we, we're not restricting ourselves to only risk-free, but we're taking measured risk so that we can get that money back and give it back to those who lent it to us in the first place. Sure. I hope I've answered your question. Um, my name's uh, Shupi Kayela Mwene. I'm from the NAB. I, I chair the, the, the policy pillar. A quick question to Zanako. Um, you recently signed uh, uh, a partnership or an agreement with uh, the European Union uh, to, to help uh, smallholder farmers with loans. And uh, it's very good because it also includes women in, in the rural areas. Um, the issue is that when are you going to come up with the guidelines and uh, the loan forms and the conditions? Thank you. Thank you for that question. In fact, you are selling for us. We've just come up with the guidelines and we've come up with a desk because we have this partnership with the EU, which is a $30 million partnership. And it has an element of climate change, and it also has an element of gender. So we are leaning more towards those businesses that are responsible businesses that will not ne negatively impact um, the environment for the future, and also for women-led businesses. So we have put together a desk in our head office uh, uh, credit no, not credit, commercial unit that is going to handle any applications. And what we're now doing is we're going to uh, update on the website uh, a, a form that people can just fill in. We're trying to make it easy. We recognize that usually uh, things are a bit difficult with dealing with banks. So as we reimagine our future, what we've said is with this particular structure, we'll make it easy for people to apply 
initially so that we can assess and turn it around quickly and say yes or no, and then follow through. But as I'm sure you'll understand, we also have the EU on the other side with that facility. So it won't be end to end just within that initial view. We test and then based on that feedback, we'll now take it to the next level. So our expectation is that as we launch it now with the desk that we have now set up, we've started with first internally, the entire team, we've shared how we're going to run with this because what we realized after we launched, after we signed, people were asking the questions, but our staff were not aware. So we started with our people and we said, this is how it will work. This is the desk. And then we tested internally so that when you now call us, your experience is positive and you're not just finding that we're not able to deliver to you. So we have now concluded our internal processes and we're now going to the market with that website capability. So that as you apply very quickly, we'll be able to tell you you are within the guidelines or not. And those that are within the guidelines, then we'll ask for a full business case. So watch out within the next week, we're going to our website with that information. We've just finalized our internal tests and we're actually going to, we've set up the desk and we're now going to the market. So I'll, I'll be happy to share my contact details as well so that we can follow through with that conversation. Thank you. So at this stage, at least allow me to at least get a question from our uh, virtual uh, audience. But however, if you still do have some questions, areas where you want clarity uh, to be provided, please feel free to forward those questions and we will spend time and respond even after the session. The question I have here is, uh, what is the appetite of our banks towards indirect investments uh, that's focused on the underserved community? Uh, and example, an example is basically the big society capital model that's in the UK. Um, I don't know whether I should start with you, Mpani, because this is specific to the banking sector, or should I extend it to Yaza? Thank you. We actually, earlier I alluded to the partnership that we have with Kukula Capital and WWF. That is indirect because we as Zanapo have put in 10 million kwacha as seed. We're funding and we'll manage that book, but the funding manager, the fund manager is actually Kukula Capital and they will handle the actual lending and return and then pass that money back to us. So what we're now doing, we've identified this as an opportunity to blend the kind of financing that's going into the market so that we're able to then harness the various opportunities and also recognize that there are certain partners who can be agile in certain spaces. So on the basis of that, we have that structure and we've actually been looking at some of those building society models as well to see how we can play into that space and be quite innovative. So we're open to those ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think where we've reached, I basically need to do the needful and bring the session to a close. I will start with Dr. Mungule. In one minute, uh, Doc, um, how can the uh, Zambia National Advisory Board for Impact Investment assist you in your mission as a central bank, especially to assist save the unbanked and unlock uh, the capital for entrepreneurs and SMEs? In one minute, please. Um, I think NABI, what they need to do is to help us uh, develop uh, data, data sets that we can use for regulatory purposes and also to get into research in the development of models uh, on uh, transition and, uh, and physical risks related to climate change. Because then the central bank will have that, uh, those models and the data, and then we shall assist the market in terms, of, uh, in terms of reducing the risks and also encouraging more investments. If risk has been regulated properly, then you're going to have a booming market. So I think that's what, uh, in a nutshell, NABI needs to, needs to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll extend the same question to Yaza. Thank you. Uh, the board needs to help us um, really come to the party to become the bridge between ourselves and, and these segments. We want to be able to collaborate and be able to co-create solutions, but with a better understanding of what it is that's required on the ground. We need to be able to look into policy reform and just be able to, to advocate in a, in a, in a concise manner. 
there's so much um, in terms of data that's out there. How can all this data come together so that it's meaningful and can be analytic and be used to the greater good? We are sitting on, I, I can't even describe how much data that, that's so valuable. And this data is what will help us in terms of providing all these valuable solutions uh, to SMEs and, and to micro entrepreneurs. Solutions are there. We just need that collaborated collaboration to come together so we can co-create and, and be able to provide some of these valuable um, solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Aza. Evelyn, your remarks. Okay. Uh, I mean, everyone's talking about data and this is the big uh, gap that needs to be filled up. So even we fintechs need that uh, information to be able to uh, provide meaningful products. But at the same time, we need uh, boards like uh, NABI to really uh, advocate to us with regulators and just ensuring that we can have uh, inclusive regulation for fintechs to operate. And at the same time, um, uh, look at how, uh, look at us as uh, very small enablers, but playing a very big role in the ecosystem. Uh, there could be advocation for startup acts. They've become very big on the continent. Uh, Zambia is still lagging behind. We don't have one. Um, as well as uh, just looking at how uh, we can also, regulators can offer competitive prices. We've seen uh, Sandbox opening up. The requirements are still very stringent uh, for startups. Uh, we're still trying to get into the Bank of Zambia Sandbox and uh, we're trying to meet half the requirements, which we haven't yet been able to. And so uh, that level playing field would be very appreciated for boards like NABI to really advocate for us. Thank you. Wendy, in just one minute. Thank you. I'd like to flip the question. What can we do for you? As the NACO, we're already dealing on the local ground with various partners that can potentially create that value into the future. And we believe that in partnerships, we'll be able to then achieve whatever it is that is the vision for NABI and for Zanaco jointly. So we believe that we're in a good place to share what we're already doing, but to learn and in the process, pull together something that will work for everyone for the future. So we're here. What can we do for you? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to my excellent uh, panel. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I think we've now come to the end of the session. I hope you've all enjoyed it, especially to our online guests. Um, I, I hope you've equally followed the discussions, like I mentioned earlier on. If you still have some questions where you need some areas of clarity or even understand what Zanaco, what Stanbic, what Lupia is still uh, trying to do in terms of serving the underserved sector even what the central bank is thinking around the regulation we do still have an opportunity there's going to be a networking lunch session please feel free to walk uh, to my excellent panel again and have that fruitful engagement once more uh, my name is monga hamkale uh, and i'm very honored to have moderated this session i hope you actually enjoyed it thank you <laughs>